Your family's health is important. Access and Kids Care can help you care for the people you care about. See a doctor on or off reservation at IHS Tribal and Urban Indian Clinics or anywhere else. Health coverage through Access and Kids Care is offered at no cost to tribal members, their children, and their grandchildren. To make an appointment with someone who can help you apply for health coverage, visit CoverAZ.org or call 211. If you already have Access or Kids Care, don't forget to renew. Cover AZ can help with that as well. That's C O V E R A Z dot org or call 211. Koen Vioma PLLC is 100% native owned and operated, founded by Viren Koen Vioma. Their practice areas include corporate law, business transactions, finance, economic development, gaming, casino development, online gaming, real estate, environmental permitting and approvals, telecommunications, government affairs, employment and labor relations, historic preservation and cultural resources, and energy. Koen Vioma Law is committed to making positive and lasting change in our communities as they support nonprofit volunteering community activism and employing Indian preference in hiring and vendor relations. Are now listening to the Carl and J Man Say the World podcast. I am your host, the five star, five diamond chef, J Man. And yes, if you can believe your ears, J Man is at work today. It's been two weeks, and uh, with me is uh, the Prince of Souls House, Carl. <laughs> so for the past two weeks, and so I, I'm back. <laughs> After the two week hiatus, somewhat, somewhat. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you can hear it, but I feel it in the back of my throat. My my voice is kind of somewhat not hundred percent because you know I spent uh, the last several days in Phoenix enjoying passions that I, I do enjoy watching so, the Phoenix Sun. In, in reference to uh, last week's episode, Carl, you did crack a joke about me and you said that you know J Man likes to do white man things, and I, I do <laughs> like to do white man things, and I'd like to think that you know. I bust my ass so that I'm able to do so some you, of these. You can white do the things. white man things more. And enjoying, you know, some of the, the things that a person enjoys. And so I was at a professional wrestling show over the last two weeks. And so that's why my voice is kind of not not all the way there. And so So you you decided to go watch men in tights. <laughs> men in tights. Yeah. <laughs> Fiddle around with each other. Exactly. And it was a blast. I had a really good time. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, I it's it, it feels nice to be back at work. I feel like it I've does. been gone. It, it you know talking for, to for you, quite yeah. a while, and so you know, big shout out to all the listeners out there for having patience with us because you know we did had have to fill some time by uh, I guess re- recycling an episode that we you, did with another you, podcast you, with a podcast that is friends of our podcast. You, you, so, know, you know, uh, big shout out to them to Nick What's when he's skateboarding. Yeah, exactly, and you know, I. The the audio in that episode wasn't the greatest, but you know it. it I it, guess it, it got it. It, it, it got for, it done. For the yeah, situation. yeah, yeah. It got it done. And then last week, you know, big shout out to our marketing intern AJ who got in there and filled my shoes. And I, I did. I think she did a really good job in helping the podcast continue. I don't know what the hell you did. You were I, doing I, last I, week. <laughs> I, you know, and so. AJ made it a tolerable episode. You, I don't know what the hell you were doing. It's like, <laughs> made it a tolerable it's episode. like you were, you've been asleep the entirety duration of the podcast. And it's like all this knowledge of how to drive that I've been trying to give to you. You, you it just went completely over your head. So. I, the last week's episode was pretty good, you know, cause I, I thought I did a really good job <laughs> on that. And, <laughs> And with AJ on my side, you know, we already have a logo going on. So it's the Carl and AJ podcast show. So we we really didn't need you 
Say say the world po- podcast show <laughs> and so, but we're back with uh, we're back with I guess what would be uh, quote what we're going to call episode ten. But I think you know as a gift to the to the listeners for tolerating kind of some of the bumps in the road that we've had this season is that we're going to extend the season. Yeah, we're going to go so ahead and extend the it. season will run past ten episodes, and that you know we're happy to announce and we would like to welcome that we do have a new sponsor to the podcast, and so I'd like to give a big shout out and a. Warm welcome to the Children's Action Alliance, who is the newest sponsor of the Paul and Jay Man Say the World podcast. And so, you know, I we kind of were joking because we had this meeting with the contact yeah, of that organization. Yeah. And then, you know, after we hung up the phone with her, like, God damn, these urban natives must really like the way you talk about them <laughs> because you would think that the way that you talk about urban natives would deter them. But the sponsorships keep rolling in. You, you so, know, the uh, I, I don't talk bad about uh, ur- urban natives. I, I just kind of lay on the the truth about urban natives and how they how they act, <laughs> something like that, right? Nothing like that. It is like that. <laughs> Nothing like that. It is but, like that. But we definitely like to welcome on to uh, the podcast as sponsors, and then also too, it's been a while since we've done this, and I'd really like to. While I'm in the shouting out mood. Yeah, go ahead and giving shout out. out shout outs. I'd like to give a shout out to our thirty pack circle of givers. Go ahead, go and ahead. So I'd like it. to give a big shout out to Alexis Kehi, to Michaela Williams, Terry Hanani, Troy Lamovaya, Brandon Coyne, Marie Nach- Nachi, uh, Deidre Kapiktuita Leslie, <laughs> Michael Ray, Aaron McEmris, and our newest uh, thirty pack circle of giver. And big shout out to Candice. Birman, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Dion Sania, Gary Lomayasva, and my good friend uh, Mikel Larzaler. Thank you all for doing that, uh, giving your monthly donations. I mean, it's a very, very big help. Although you know, it's 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 so small, but it is very, very big. And we we thank you for doing that. Every month is is something new and special, and it keeps us going. It keeps us alive. It keeps us um, making fun of each other, bringing on new guests, new subjects, new topics, and we are we will be doing a live podcast at the end of this end of the season here. So we're just going to keep pushing it. So get ready for that. It's going to be here in the studio here in. Uh, uh, beautiful downtown uh, Kikotsmovi, Arizona. Yeah, I have absolutely nothing to do with this. So, you know, when that shit crashes, <laughs> you can send all your uh, complaints towards Carl. See, if you <laughs> if you had done the puppets with me, <laughs> we would have been like YouTube hits. Yeah, yeah, I think we would have been, we would have tanked by then. So if, <laughs> if we had done the puppets, but, you know, and, and so the, the season will go beyond 10 episodes this, this season. And also too, you know, I, I guess, uh, last week's episode, because, uh, you and AJ were talking about the powwow scene yeah. and Hopi's involvement with powwow that, you know, it actually became a popular episode. It is. It and, became you know, a it, huge episode. To, to be beyond my anticipation, because then, you know, I really didn't know what the, interest from our listeners in regards to the topic of powwow but it was kind of interesting because then you know the, there were some comments that were made yeah yeah uh, some good some bad and and so it was funny because one of the listeners did tell me that you know it was like they're talking about uh well i guess in particular it was uh not knowing about the powwow scene yeah not yeah. knowing about the phoenix suns but i guess to me like that was the point the point was that hopis don't really know anything about no powwow. like and like what i said we're yeah. out there dancing and and doing this whole you know, thing that's what i said i and, don't know anything about well powwow. i i think because i i deduced it down to the fact that you know because aj had some strong opinions about the northern powwows and, yeah and how they get down up there so i figured that oh this person Person's probably a southern powwow, southern powwow girl. person, and yeah. you know, but it kind of made me think though it's because then you know, because that is where this developed. It came from the, the south plains areas, oh, you it mean came the north? from uh areas not f- it, it didn't come from the southwest, yeah. And so, you know, it's kind of like the equivalent to saying that 
the greatest pizza in the world comes from the state of Arizona. From, of course, uh, if you make from that declar- make, if you make that <laughs> declaration, then somebody's going to get upset about it because then the origins of pizza, I really come from a different place, and so. But it was an interesting topic, and uh, you know, big shouts out to Kyle for coming on and, and sharing his information, and you know, I, I guess you know, really a. In reflection back to that topic is that, you know, yeah, yeah. One, one thing one thing that kind of wasn't really discussed in, to a whole lot of degree, I think that Kyle kind of made mention of it. But really, you know, I guess as far as powwow goes, because then, you know, powwow, it's kind of like one of the most well-known practices, I guess, as far as Indian country as a whole. It, it's a commercial practice and, now. And, and what makes it kind of a unique conversation is that here on Hopi, that you still have a lot of quote unquote traditionalists who kind of discourage their own children or people from within their families in participating. In the and, and in so I, I guess that kind of makes it a unique conversation because then you know in the grand scheme of Indian country, yeah, that powwow yeah. is this place of inclusivity where everybody's welcome, and then I think uh, to a degree it becomes this melting pot of communities of different communities of different tribes coming together for the purpose of i guess getting together yeah yeah and and the other part of it too you know and aj made a a pretty good comment on this too is that you know i guess really in the urban areas is where it becomes huge yeah because then you know in places like phoenix places like albuquerque even los angeles chicago where you have large population of indigenous peoples living then these powwows tend to become that magnet that attracts everybody together in celebration of our, you, you know, quote you, unquote indigeneity. But then you get these asshole Hopis out here that, you know, say, no, we shouldn't be participating. You, you in know, I, I've gotten a lot of and, uh, and so that's kind texts of, like that. That's what yeah. makes it unique. That's what makes it unique. And we did get those, com- we did get those comments through our social media of some of our Hopi people kind of relaying that message that, no, we shouldn't be participating in you, you know because it doesn't belong to in, our in hopi and stuff like that and mm-hmm. and that's what i got i got some texts as well too saying that you know the episode uh on the hopi and powwow scene is that we should just keep both both uh cultures separate but yet but yet we we incorporate like navajo apache um you know, we all of those different types of other cultures like that into Hopi and we honor them as the same way. So I kind of have like mixed feelings about it as well, too. And yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, you know, Kyle last week, Kyle, he was discussing that it's not his his uh, main mm-hmm. tradition. And I, mm-hmm. I get it. I get that where he's coming from is like it's just something that he likes to do as like an sort of like on the side kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. And I I thought it was really good to have him there to talk about it because as he mentioned that he did have those experiences of discouragement and and growing up in that way from, from a, especially when he was a traditional Hopi perspective as a younger Hopi. And so I think that was really the purpose of the episode was to get that out there. And, you know, you guys did get that out there. And so that was kind of one of the comments. And uh, I was kind of uh, a little jealous that, you know, you guys got to have this Phoenix Suns conversation (laughs) without you. When when the biggest (laughs) Phoenix Suns fan in the room was, was on sabbatical. Well, you know, you should have been here. So (laughs) I don't know why you didn't want to be here. And you know, that that's why I kind of reference back to you like i don't know what the hell you were doing because then you know you guys were having this conversation we had a, we had a good conversation about the phoenix, about phoenix suns, suns and the i i guess this attempt in honoring indigenous tribes of of arizona and you basically accused the phoenix suns of uh trying to wipe out natives by it's, selling them jerseys I was it's, like, what the it's fuck not is he it's not uh, it's not an <laughs> accusation uh when it's true think about it how much I, did you I, pay for your jersey? I, I, I don't know how commercialism uh, plays a part in the annihilation of uh, a people, <laughs> Carl. But you know that was basically the ac- accusation that you. You know made. all of that money that and, if we and, if and we didn't spend if we didn't spend money on the jerseys, we would probably. I, I say that Phoenix Sun should have given us a jersey instead of we have to buy it ourselves. It's basically selling us our own designs back to us. Well, you know, I guess I I definitely have a different take on it because, you know, I think that, you know, 
when this jersey was revealed and yeah. when all the marketing came out from the Phoenix Suns yeah. about celebrating Indigenous Heritage Month or Native American Heritage Month, whatever it's called, that, of course, you know, there was a lot of dialogue on social media through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And for the most part, the majority of what I saw, which was a shocker to me because yeah. Natives, you know, were some of the most negative MFers in the world. But, you know, it was fairly positive. Yeah, I saw, yeah. you know, mostly positive comments from the Native community online. And, you know, when this jersey came out, I actually saw this jersey probably yeah. about yeah. two weeks before it was unveiled because on Twitter, I'm a very much active member of the Phoenix Suns Twitter community and so you know through this community on Twitter that oftentimes you get to see images of leaked images yeah, of things yeah, that are in. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah. saw the jersey ahead of time I just didn't know it was the official jersey and so when the jersey came out I said oh okay so it was that design that was leaked and you know I, I think for me coming from a Phoenix Suns perspective like we talk about identity and the identity of this Phoenix Suns team to me is that you know our colors are purple and orange yeah and so i think that that was kind of the one thing that i didn't like about the jersey the, it was turquoise was and that it was that there was no semblance of a phoenix, phoenix suns, suns yeah. team colors in the uniform and if you're an actual advent watcher of the nba then you know that these jerseys were very much reflective of another nba team which was the oklahoma city thunder mm -hmm. And and so I guess to me, just nitpicking being a Phoenix Suns fan, that when you see a uniform that's supposed to be a representative of the team that you've watched for all these years, that, that the you want to see some something. semblance yeah. of your team within the uniform. And I really thought that the only semblance of Phoenix Suns was the Sunburst logo that was on top of the chest. <laughs> the but if black. that logo was gone, like you would have absolutely no idea. It was that, a generic that it made. It was a jersey for the Phoenix Suns. It would have been so a that, that like a gen gen my, generic made one. That was kind of my 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 little nitpick. And of course, you know, uh, most folks are familiar with uh, N7, which is a branch of uh, Nike. Yeah. And so I believe that they were very much involved in the in the designing of this jersey as well, or at least you know a lot of the other uh, merchandise that was associated with the launch. And you know the shorts too. That the shorts were, was something that I actually really liked. I really did like the shorts because then on the side it had the the native design, and then I know on the top and bottom they both had the word for sun in all twenty two uh, languages of Arizona. But then you know I kind of thought about that too, and I guess this just comes from overthinking it. But then it's like okay, you have the word for sun for all twenty two tribal nations, but then yet. Because some of these tribal nations are actually related to each other. So some words in sun probably repeated itself because then you have the San Carlos Apache tribe and the White Mountain Apache tribe and their languages are, <laughs> are sim similar. similar. Yeah, And then even that, that the Apache language is similar to the Navajo language. And so you have some similarities in that. And so I, you know, thinking of that is that some of these languages got a little bit catered to a little bit more because then you have several branches of tribes in the state of Arizona whose languages are very, very similar. And of course, I don't believe that there's a language that's similar to Hopi. And so when it came to Artawa, that, you know, it really were the only tribe that has that word in that way. In I didn't our see, own language I didn't see Tawa on there. I was trying to look for that one. And, and so that was kind of my, my little nitpick. But I, I guess really on the positive side, you know, in, in my opinion, in my opinion, that I really do think, and especially because you guys had this conversation last week, and since that time, they've debuted the jersey, they've already played yeah. games yeah. in that jersey. And in my opinion, that I feel like that they've done this in... Oh, they did more than I, what I thought they were going to do. Yeah. And one of the biggest things is when they debuted the jersey, when the players actually wore the jersey, that they wore it when they played a game against the Golden State Warriors. And so anytime that a team plays the Golden State Warriors, that attention is going to be high for that game because over the last five years, the Golden State Warriors are one of the most popular teams in the NBA. Yeah. And so for the Suns to debut that jersey against that team on national television, I thought that that kind of just drew more attention to what it is that they were doing. So it kind of left out the native part of it and drew more attention to the Suns actually doing this 
kind of uh, uh, publicity stunt, right? <laughs> I, I kind of don't understand the question. I mean, uh, how, how are you leaving the natives out when the New Jersey is about the natives and that when the majority of the entertainment at these games are coming from indigenous people? You know, you know what, what it been, did, what it did, and if you would have said it in this way, it would have been more accurate, is that it drew more attention to the indigenous communities for the state of Arizona uh, through this game that they played. It didn't draw attention to me. <laughs> I'm a Native American, and nobody said that. Hey, you know, let's uh, let's go out and meet Carl because uh, the sons are playing in in uh, Native colors there. So he didn't, didn't come to me or anything like that. I don't. Right. I don't think that was the purpose. I think it was of the, purpose. the campaign was to draw attention to Solus boys <laughs> that are living in their Solus basement and you know doing whatever it is that Solus boys do. I, okay, so I mean, I love the sons. I, I've loved the sons since 1990. And just like you two, I I followed the Suns as well. And you didn't even know what basketball was before this year, Carl. <laughs> I had to explain it to you. I'm an OG, man. I'm OG. <laughs> you, I dragged you on. You were still uh, in your whitey tighties uh, jumping off of couches thinking that you're going to uh, hit big in the W, uh, whatever, the wrestling, wrestling World Federation, or I don't know what it's called now. So, but anyway... I, I do like the Suns. I do like the Suns, and I do like the jersey. I, I love the jersey. It's just that I think that they're just more or less capitalizing on on the way that they're doing it. Like you know, if if it if they were truly honoring like natives for just that month, they would have free games for Native Americans. Like you know, all month long, free games. You can go anytime you want. Uh, have pictures, sign autographs and whatnot, and you can get a commemorative, uh, you know, just, just just something like that would have been a little bit better instead of us actually going out and buying a hundred and dollar plus jersey. I don't know how much they cost. In, in true native fashion, Carl, you have a lot of complaints against this, but I know for a fact that you're not going to spend a single dollar on any of this merchandise that's coming out. Yeah, I'm but not. you know, it's it's interesting. I think this whole thing, this whole situation, could be a conversation, like a whole yeah. whole whole podcast episode conversation. Because I think you know, at least as far as last week goes, you guys did have good points. Because then, as far as you know, the NBA, it's a business. You know, it is. First, it is first, a business. first and foremost, it's a business, and the purpose of business is to make money yeah and so you know and i i think as native peoples that you know that tends to be our mentality is that well if you're going to be talking about us then you got to give us something for it yeah yeah and you know i guess in the reality of it the only thing free that we received was uh i guess the attention the attention through the televised games through the social media accounts but as far as the actual product that we still have to pay full price for it and these jerseys cost over a hundred dollars that they have some really nice merchandise that cost a lot of money too as well and yeah. so you know we they really did capitalize on us because then through social media that i did see a lot of our native peoples buying this merchandise for that very high cost yeah and you know so it, one could make this argument that you know it i guess you could do something better with your money coming from these indigenous communities. But then to me, I always thought about that too, is that like, well, if we're not spending money on these jerseys, we're going to spend some, that exact same money on something stupid. Like as well. drugs and, and hookers and so and like beer. It, it, it's, it doesn't really, you know, I, to me that, that that's not a, a really good argument, but I, I guess as far as, you know, what our expectation is from this, what it is that they're doing, I think that, you know, it differs Depending on who you ask, yeah, I guess like that. I, like, I like, guess, like I guess you're, you're, the comment that you made specifically about well, it didn't bring attention to me, and you know that was another thought that I had too. Is that because then you know in a way we're we're somewhat compartmentalized as far as native peoples because then you know we really all have different mentalities because then us reservation natives we have a different mentality we have a different mentality and you know i i can admit that when this marketing first came out of course i was looking for the hopi representation yeah. in the videos that show that followed i was looking you know where's the hopis because we want to you, be, you know it, we want to you, be felt like we're included in this <clears throat> yeah exactly and you know if if all by means, if Devin Booker is listening to this podcast, which I'm pretty sure he doesn't even know that we exist in all of his entire world. Of course world. he knows we exist. No, he's he doesn't my, even. He's my best friend. He doesn't even know that you exist. I have a picture with him. <laughs> 
So and his autograph. If de- yeah, you probably paid for it too. I did it. <laughs> well, I paid for the jersey, but the autograph was free. If Devin Booker is listening to this podcast, you know you 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 are a great player. I have to admit it, but quit capitalizing on us and come and take a picture with me. And so I can get it some free and so I can say, Hey, so I met something, met someone cool and famous. Mm-hmm. And, and so really, you know, that, that, that is the, the reservation perspective is that is, is what do I get out of this? Yeah. Because then we're not, we're not, we're not front and center of this. No. Because when they did the marketing, yeah. when they brought these indigenous businesses in to help with the collaboration, when they brought the artists in, when they brought the kids, who were a majority of those people? Yeah. They were urban natives because Phoenix obviously is in an urban area. And that, you know, when you think about the Phoenix Suns that they play in the city of Phoenix, whose backyard is that? It's the backyard to the people that live within that area. With, so yeah. to me, like, I really thought that it was a big victory for the urban native community because then, you know, they're the ones that are right there on the same street as the arena yeah. in the same vicinity of that team. And so, like I said, that when it came to collaboration, Collaboration when it came to bringing in folks to do the marketing, imagery, all of that, that I can guarantee that a majority of them were all urban natives. No, yeah, of course. And, you know, like I, I support the Phoenix Suns and I do watch, uh, you know, their games as well, too. But, you know, it's just, I guess it's just sort of like that idea that it's just like capitalizing on the whole native scene. And so speaking of artists, mm-hmm. you know, we do have, well, well I, I do, I do have to clear up one thing. Cause you and I got into an exchange after the episode that the comments were made that the Phoenix Suns organization, and I'm probably doing this out of the love for my team is that they do have a charity arm. Yes, they do have a charity arm. And then, so, you know, this charity arm gives money back into the communities and that, you know, I do know for a fact that, reservations have benefited from this Phoenix Suns Charities arm, including the Hopi tribe has also benefited from this Phoenix Suns Charity arm. We got backpacks. And so uh, just to clear up any (laughs) anger from some of the listeners. We got backpacks and pencils from the Phoenix Suns. The Phoenix Suns organization does give back to the community. We got free cookies. Although to what extent I cannot truthfully or factually say because I really don't know, but. So, which means that we got backpacks from the Phoenix Suns from third world country. That's pretty much all that, that's all they can donate. But anyway, speaking of artists and speaking of how art we, and we are getting to the the season of artists where people are going to be going to bazaars. People are going to be doing, selling their artwork at uh, Christmas bazaars, at Thanksgiving bazaars and and, and speaking of that, we do have a, a a local artist here in the studio right now, and she will be discussing about how she got uh, started in her art. You know, I had this thought because, you know, every time that we have a special guest, you know, we'd make the announcement, oh, we have a special guest, but because... AJ has been on, this is her third time on the podcast. <laughs> She's going to be on here for, in, for a long for, time. For, for this, just this season. So with her being such a regular, is she still a special guest or is she just by default the third She's the she's just a person now. She just became the she just became a regular on the podcast. But but anyway, um, you know, she supports my ideas of the Phoenix Suns and you don't. So we're going to start our own podcast. It's going to be called the AJ and Carl uh, Save the World podcast. Yeah, she'll get real comfortable with you and start uh, belittling <laughs> you the way that I do. And so I'd be really interested in hearing that. She already does on on uh, Facebook and everything like that. <laughs> Have you seen the posts on Facebook? Why in the hell would you like Where's the Fry Bread post? And I love that it, image. It's so st- I love I that I mean, it, image. it gave me, it got us a lot of, uh, I, you I know. literally LOL'd when I saw the, I approved that by shut the up. way. So. <laughs> shut up. Just and shut so AJ, up. You're, you're, you're back with us again. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Um, and I think that now it's time to do a full introduction because most of the time I just say, hi, I'm AJ, technical assistant. Um, but, but you're so much more than that. You're so much yeah, more than just yeah. our technical So she's, assistant. you know, she's not just our and intern. She's actually a, a, a really great artist. Yes. And so AJ, go ahead and give your Appreciate full introduction. That, Carl. Um, so <clears throat> I am a multifaceted artist and um, business person, I guess. 
Primarily, I work in my own art business. I run my own art business, which is called the Vehung Nim Creations. Um, Nyut the Vehung Nim, so that's my Hopi name, um, meaning Juniper Girl Standing Tall. And I carry that as my business name because I, you know, that's my identifier. That's how people know me. That's how we know each other. And so that's how I brand my business, basically. That's my brand is the Vehung Nim. Um, how do you spell it? How do you, can we look you up yeah, on? It's a T U V E. H O N G N O M. That's very, very long. Yeah. No, but <laughs> that's not my problem. <laughs> that's not my problem. It's your problem for naming me that. Yeah. Um, if you can't say it, then you can learn. <laughs> but um, I also do social media management for um, a couple of clients. I think I now manage four clients, nice. um, including you guys. So. Um, that's a big thing kind of now for me within the last two years is focusing in on digital social media management because I see it as a new niche where, you know, not a lot of people are working in because I feel that as natives, we have a lot of things to consider before we can even go into that avenue. Um, so, you know, about a little more about my business and the history of it, um, I never really planned to create a business. I didn't sit down one day and say, I'm going to, I'm going to start a business and this is what it's going to be named. I actually, um, started just making things. Um, I've actually always been a part of art. So it goes back probably to infancy. Um, both my parents are artists. My dad carves and welds. My mom is a painter. Um, and, they both did that all my life. We attended shows throughout my entire life. That was all I ever knew. They were full-time artists, so we were always traveling for shows, traveling for gallery openings, things like that. And it was just something I always knew. Um, I became their salesperson, I think, around the age of 11 or 12. So I started understanding how you um, talk to people, how you explain your art, how you, you know, explain and haggle and things like that. And so early on, I learned a lot about that. Um, and so it was just part of what I did. It wasn't anything really special to me. It wasn't something that I sought out to learn. Um, and then I, you know, graduated high school 2018, left to Fort Lewis College to go pursue my BA. And initially, I was in going for um, athletic training. And about a year into it, I switched majors to Native American and Indigenous Studies. And that's where I really um, gained an understanding of how important cultural arts and cultural knowledge is, um, not only just to have it and know it, but how it benefits you as an individual. And so I think a lot of my... Um, progression as a person and as an artist can be related to me being an artist and understanding that I'm able to create things out of nothing with my hands almost solely and that's really apparent in my um the silversmithing because I can literally take a rock and you know a piece of stone and a sheet of metal and create something out of it and to me that's incredibly that's like crazy, you know, to think that if you think of something in your mind, you conjure that image in your mind and you work hard enough for it, it can be a reality. And that every single time it blows my mind because a lot of what I do comes from dreams, comes from things like that, that just pop into my head and I have to create them or else it'll bug me. But a lot of the time that's what it was, was I just wanted to make things. I always made things for my family. Um, like I said, I started off as a painter, drawer, as a little kid. That was my first medium. I did a couple art shows and won a couple of, um, like, the uh, student juried competitions, um, placed a couple times and things like that. And then my first non-drawing uh, medium was, I think, pottery and kind of stuff like that. And then I moved on and uh, learned how to weave guewa. And so that was a big part of... Uh, kind of what I do now too, like the textiles, understanding textiles and understanding clothing. And so because I learned uh, 
the weaving aspect of it, I became really interested in that in undergraduate. And so I went into museums and would look at, would always seek out the Native American section and constantly look at the artwork and the clothing and things like that that were in there, especially the textiles, if there were any Pueblo textiles. And I like to learn about how it was constructed because I think that we often forget that our ancestors really um, adorn themselves. They like to, you know, decorate themselves, decorate their bodies, but um, not so much the body meaning in tattoo or anything like that. But in our textiles, we were really talented in making amazing designs and colors and things like that. And we don't translate that um, love for adorning ourselves like that into the current um, society. And so part of my work is that, is reminding people that this is not, um, like it's not a luxury thing. This is something our ancestors did. They wanted to look nice. They wanted to look presentable. And so they dressed well, basically, and that's all I'm trying to do. So, so describe your so describe your artwork. How well, 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 before what, what, before you answer that, AJ, because so, you know the the original concept was that we were going to bring you on to do this discussion about fashion because yeah. then we talked about uh, doing a second fashion episode because we had done one last season, and I thought that you did a really good job with the information that you shared in the last episode with the knowledge on kind of some of the more contemporary uh, fashion pieces that that natives wear today in this day and age. And I think really your last comment was kind of really spoke to the topic of what uh, that last year's episode was as far as native fashion, kind of as how we saw fashion or how we see fashion as people of trying to be a representation of our identity. And I think now in this day and age, because then, you know, I think that we're so we're, we're interested in so many things other outside of than just our own culture. And, you know, maybe he can comment on this because I, I did see something over the weekend that I thought was really interesting because, um, you know, outside of just the Phoenix Suns, and I apologize for that long rant on that. But, you know, enough a, with the Phoenix a, Suns by ASU now. also celebrated uh, Native Heritage Month over the weekend. And what usually what they'll do is that they'll have a group of native students and they uh, show them on the football field during, during the game at some point in time. And just, you know, to make the crowd aware that we do also celebrate native American heritage month, but you know, it was an interesting (coughs) image to see because then, you know, my, my daughter that goes to school there now, she was a part of that group that was on the field. And of course I was really happy to see her. And, but there was one girl in particular, she had her, uh, Canel Kwasa on, she had her Cueva on, she had her Hopi Totis on, and then she was wearing her Ete appropriately how you should wear it, young girls out there over her shoulders. And that just made me so happy because then, you know, I guess at least as far as identification, that she looked like what a Hopi mana should look like. And and so if you can kind of give your interpretation of how identity plays into fashion. Um, especially in this in this contemporary time, because then you guys did talk about. Before you answer that question, I want to ask you this question: Explain your artwork to uh, to a degree. How what what is your artwork displayed as? How, how what what do you do as an artwork as an artist? Right now, primarily, I work in um, <clears throat> dentalium jewelry, which are dentalium shells, which are northern uh, medium. I also do painted parfletch jewelry, which is rawhide. Um, that's more of a old Hopi thing. Um, it's like thousand years ago art form. Um, you know, a lot of people out here, they paint on the wood. And so I, not having availability to wood, <laughs> not being a carver, I, you know, did research in my undergraduate and found that there were, um, there was a catch of, um, s- painted flowers found in this place called Sunflower Cave, which I believe is in southern Utah. And in those flowers, there was two of them that were painted on rawhide. And they believe that these were used in ceremony. And so, you know, this art form of painting on the rawhide was done a thousand years ago. And we've just, um, I think we just haven't, 
we don't do it because we don't have people who tan hides and process hides out here. So it's just not a medium that we do. So that's something I do. And with that, it's, I like to treat it like little canvases. So I don't, um, <clears throat> I don't really use a lot of Hopi imagery. I don't do a lot of symbols and stuff like that. Um, I use the ones that are kind of important to me. So like the rain clouds and stuff, the Nova Omao rain clouds too, because um, my, I have a, like a connection to water and things like that. And so I feel that um, that's something I use, but I don't use a lot of pottery designs because I don't understand them and I don't use stuff like that. Um, I like to take the concept of them and design from them being inspired by it, not directly taking it and copying and pasting it onto something and selling. So, so more or less like, like you know, contem a, you, yeah, contemporary, contemporary, quote unquote, yeah. contemporary. Yeah. And it, it's hard saying that because in my mind I am traditional. I think of things from a traditional place, but to, when you think of traditional arts, all you think of are these, um, like textiles. Yeah, yeah, textiles, yeah, textiles. You think of the pottery designs, the um, you the, know, the real the bold lines and things, the ge yeah. geographic or geo geometric designs. Yeah, and so a lot of that is kind of what I use, but I try not to use it directly in the imagery. Again, I try to pull from it. So, like understanding that they mean these meanings, and then taking that meaning and creating something from it. I I, I think that kind of might tie into. The, the question that it asked for Carl rudely interrupted you rudely your, interrupted your me first so. well it's perfectly okay to rudely interrupt it, you, Carl, it's not. because then you know most of the time any direction that you drive towards is always going to end in a dead end and so you know anything <laughs> that the pathways that I take tend to lead us to greener pastures oh so, yeah so why don't you just sit back and uh, strap in a little oh, bit yeah and I'm just well, well we're, we're both adults are having a conversation right now so <laughs> no but I, I well I think you know kind of the the con the, the comments that you made Made AJ, I guess, really, you know, as an artist, the designs and the symbolisms that you do choose to use is that a reflection? Is I, I guess, really, you know, as an artist, does, does that tend to be a reflection then of who you are, of your belief sets, or do you think that artists differ in that rather than just limiting themselves to what it is that they know? that they try to uh, appease the masses, I guess, and try to increase business by utilizing more things that people are, are knowledgeable about. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I do think that it's as an artist, that's hard to do because, you know, you want to be original, but if you're, if people don't understand it, it's hard to make sales. But for me, my attitude is always, well, I know there's someone out there that this was made for. So if it doesn't sell to you, it's waiting for someone else. And so I'm not too concerned about like sales, even though I am concerned because I have to pay my tuition. That's my main goal right now is why I do as much work you're, as I do. You're paying for yeah. your tuition? So I'm paying out of pocket for my master's I tuition. I have not paid my tuition. And, um, <laughs> and um, my goal is to graduate my master's degree without any debt. And because um, I did that with my undergraduate degree, I took out no loans. It was yeah. all out of pocket. I plan to do the same thing with my master's degree. And so I work very hard to try to make as much income as I can because it all almost solely goes to my tuition payment. And so that's, you know, I am concerned about sales to an extent, but it, I'm not going to like make someone buy it. And I'm not going to conform to what people want to see from me. And that's another thing, too, is I, I've i been asked, can you make me a skirt with, quote, unquote, native fabric, native material? And I do not. I refuse because I don't support the printing of those fabrics because, for one, it's done in a big factory, which pollutes, um, Two. Those are generic designs that are used, more likely appropriated from some culture and slapped together and then, you know, marketed to natives as being some some tie to their culture when in reality there is no tie there. Um, so I, I don't use those prints like that from like Joann's, Odegaard's, things like that. I will do it... Um, 
in a way that is, like you said, representative of my identity. And my identity comes a lot from the way my family taught me is that, you know, if you do things from this mindset, from this Hopi mindset, it is Hopi. Because how, what else would it be if you're doing it from that mindset, you know? And if you do it from a Pahana mindset, then it's Pahana in nature. And so it's, you know, it's a hard line to straddle because I think if I did make things like that did appease the masses, my sales would go up. Or if I mass produced and made things um, more accessible, it would promote my sales. But as an artist, I don't like to mass produce, um, which is why I don't offer t-shirts and stuff like that. I um, you could Everything's get that, handmade. That doctorate degree, AJ. <laughs> Uh, paid paid off if mm-hmm. you <laughs> it, it, it's interesting conversation because carl i don't know because i mean i guess to an degree you're an artist as well but not in the sense of uh for business but i, I, I mean, do it to make money i, <laughs> I don't care about hope because you know that that is an interesting conversation because then you know i guess as as an artist but as you mentioned you still have a business yeah and so there's still some level of responsibility i guess for making money to make sure that green is still coming in and especially you know you do have a a specific goal which is is really important and so you know i I guess you know this conversation and this topic is kind of new to me because then you know i don't i've never considered myself an artist but you know being here on hopi you have so many artists out there you know i make this joke that you know as far as uh hopi artists they're like uh pizza shops in Mm -hmm. new york city that there's one on they just pop up every every now and and then and you know i guess as an artist and you maybe that's something that you can speak to AJ is what are some of the difficulties in making yourself stand out in a crowd full in a community full of artists? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and to kind of piggyback on that as well too, has anybody um like shunned down your artwork before? Um to answer the how I make you know make my services differ from everyone else's, I think mine in it being something that I'm trying to really promote um, the continuation of a cultural art. So when I talk to people at shows, I don't just say hi. You know, if you have questions, if you want to know the price, let me know. I'll, you know, in, I'll greet them, introduce myself, tell them this is where I'm from. This is my the work that I do. And this is kind of where it originates from. And that's almost all always the script I go through when meeting a new client or customer or whoever comes across me. I, you know, I tell them this is why mine will differ from this person next to me. It's because it's material is different. It's design is different. Um, you know, and the time and effort I put into it is very high quality. And I'm sure many people put in the time and effort, but it's the material and it's the design that I think mine um, differs from mine. Because again, mine's more contemporary and I like to pull from um, pop pop culture, quote unquote. You know, I like a lot of anime and manga and stuff like that. And so a lot of my illustrations have to do with um, kind of like that type of... um, that art form, the way that style looks, because that's what I'm very used to seeing. That's what I'm kind of skilled in is that style. I understand how it works because um, I, I just like the artwork of it. And so that's my painting style on my earrings, but I think it's the material. Honestly, Um, I was at a powwow like two weeks ago vending and it was funny. I was talking to a lady and I told her, yeah, I'm from Hopi and I make, you know, the, Parfletch pieces and she goes you're at the Vehongnam right and I said yeah and she goes I know you I've seen your work and I um you know one of my aunts or my uncles bought me something from you like two years ago and I remember your card I remember your name and they told me it was rawhide and I've never heard of anyone else out there painting on rawhide so I knew it was you and I was like wow you know 200 miles away someone like just randomly talking with them recognized my work. And so that was kind of like the, I don't know, the, the kick. Yeah. The kick where I was like, wow, I guess I am known for that. 
that's when you realize that you're famous. <laughs> you <laughs> kind of made it. You <laughs> made it up there. Yeah, but yeah. So it was kind of like, oh wow. So I, I, I am known for this art form, and so that's how I think it differs. And then to answer your question, Carl, I've not really had anyone talk down on like exactly what I'm doing now. I've had people question. Again, why do you make ribbon skirts? Why do you make this? And in yeah. the last episode, yeah. I answered that is, well, I didn't go into it to make profit. I did it because of, um, I wanted to offer something to my in-laws. I wanted to be able to be part of what they do and not just, you know, kind of be there, be part of the family. But I wanted to contribute in some way. And so I thought I can at least learn how to make things for them, gift them things. And so... That was my whole start on that. But, you know, I think when people hear that and they understand, oh, I didn't, I learned to create for people not to make money. I think that yeah. gives them a better yeah. sense of me. But um, I think the thing is like the, well, it doesn't, it's not really Hopi. Like I've gotten that before, yeah, but yeah. a lot actually from non, non Hopis. So one of the first shows I ever did, <laughs> um, yeah, like Bahanam. Yeah, and they so, say that. Yeah, it's they not tell me really? it's not native jewelry. Yeah, and I tell them, well, who are you to tell me that? Yeah, like what what gives you any any accreditation to tell me yeah. that this is not Hopi? Because I, a Hopi person, created this with my hands, and that's a lot of what I kind of fight against. Is well, it doesn't look Hopi. It's not really Hopi because it doesn't look like it. And to me, it's like, well, again, I did it from that mindset. So mm -hmm. how is it not? What is it then? Is it just just jewelry? You, no. <laughs> you know, uh, a, a couple of years ago, there was something that was on, on Facebook. And it was a drawing somebody did of like... Uh, of uh of of Katinam and it was this it was it was a small drawing and one commenter said that it looks like a child's drawing which it was not a child's drawing it was done by an adult yeah. like a full grown man and this guy said that it's very very bad i don't like it and the commenters were saying like you know oh keep up the good work it's good work and stuff like that and i i had to defend the guy who said he didn't like it because i didn't like it either <laughs> it looked like a kid's drawing and so and the reason why i'm saying that is because a lot of the times we don't we don't know that we're bad artists everybody <laughs> <laughs> No, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, our, our brainwaves might have been on the same wavelength because that was the next thing I no, was going to bring do. up is that because, you know, I I guess, you know, being out here as in in, in a community full of artists, yeah. you often see people selling different art items and that, you know, you always hear this message, you know, support support your local artists, yeah. you know, support native artists. And I, I guess, you know, that, that I guess then tends to be a question for both of you, AJ and Carl, because uh, as an artist yourself, AJ, AJ, um, I don't know. Do you, if you uh, are a consumer of other local artists, and then Carl, I don't know if you're a consumer of local artists. And you know, because for me, honestly, I I really don't buy a whole lot of things unless they're from people that I know. Because then I guess in my head, I think that okay, well, if I buy something from AJ, she's somebody I know. Yeah. So it's my way of supporting. I'm her. not going to buy from AJ. Or <laughs> if there's you know other artists out there that I personally know, I might buy something. Yeah. But I guess really it's with the intention that I'm supporting them. Yeah. And it's not necessarily maybe because they created something that I just That's love. That you want. And yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, and the other point that I was going to make too, I guess as far as, you know, because I guess I've never really considered that about like when you're looking at somebody that is a business owner, especially in the art world, I guess really examining what their, um, what what their uh, personal beliefs are as far as what it is that they create like yeah. are they trying yeah. to be culturally sensitive to our culture which is something that I would really respect if I knew that that was their approach to how they develop their art or are they just somebody that's trying to make a buck because then you know like us natives we love to get on the bandwagon as soon as the sports team gets good 
There's tons of, of yeah. sports memorabilia. Sports memorabilia. And so, you know, it's talking about the With Phoenix native Suns. native stuff, yeah. That within the last two years, you have tons of these different variations of Phoenix Sun shirts that started to come along before the Phoenix Suns started doing it themselves. Yeah. But then to me, like, I get, as a Phoenix Suns fan, I get annoyed knowing damn well when a certain artist has expressed that they're a Golden State Warriors fan <laughs> and trying to make money <laughs> off of my Phoenix Suns fandom. Yeah. I'm like, fuck that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so, not going to support you. So, no, yeah. so like, like what I was saying is like uh, before is that there was an artist that did that, and like I said, we're we don't know that we're bad artists out there. There's a lot of bad <laughs> artists, bad Hopi artists, and I, I'm I'm saying that I'm saying that there's a lot of bad Hopi artists, but yet we don't say it to their face because we think that they're going to go far with their art. And so, how do we know that we're good? And un- if nobody tells us that we're bad at being at being something, you know, it's like, yeah, it's I like it's that. it's like uh, like um, with uh, Van Gogh. Remember Van? You, you, everybody knows the story about Van Gogh. He's created paintings, yeah. and nobody liked his paintings. <laughs> Everybody hated it. It's like, why the hell did you paint the sunflower? You know, it's yeah. stupid. And when he died and then people appreciated that, saying that this is one of the most beautiful artworks and renditions of a sunflower I have ever seen. So how do we know that we're bad or we're, we're good artists if we never heard if that we're bad? If never struggled. Yeah, if yeah. we never struggled. Mm-hmm. If, we, mm-hmm. if, keep, if people keep on saying that, oh, keep it up, keep doing what you're doing, even though you're bad at it, even though (laughs) and people will say that I agree and um, I think that's a not a generational thing because I I got that from my family you know like constructive criticism and so when people ask you know, in job interview, how do you take constructive criticism? I tell them I love it. I love hearing people like talk shit to me because it's funny. It's amusing to listen to what you have to say to me because it's I can take from it and use it to my advantage yeah it's not gonna really maybe it'll make me feel bad you know for a bit but it's there to help you grow because yeah. if this yeah. is the negative things that people think of you well what can i do to make that not not apparent no more and so for me you know being told i've never been told your work is not quality it don't look good yeah but I think that's because I have 20 plus years of experience in drawing and yeah. in um, kind of in the um, silver work, too, because my solo tells me the first time I soldered something, I was like six years old. And so, you know, to me, it's like, well, that was just something I did. It, I never thought of myself. I never said, oh, yeah, I'm an artist yeah. as a yeah. child. Mm-hmm. It, I just knew how to do. I just knew how to weave. I knew how to do these things. It wasn't until I went to college that people were telling me, you're an artist. And I was like, oh, I am. I didn't know that. I didn't know. Because in Hopi, and I think in all indigenous languages, we don't have a word for art. That A-R-T, that idea of something being there for presentation you know we we do these things because they're part of our culture we you know make these clothing items because we needed clothes to wear but it was nice looking and so we they were more utilitarian than um aesthetics you know and now that's what it's leaned towards is aesthetics like so like you were asking justin how do i play into that like how do i um satisfy people with that but i try to not satisfy the masses again because i understand that there is a a niche for my business which is largely native american women you know and i produce for them and for um non-binary and two-spirit people who wear skirts and jewelry and who want to adorn themselves and feel beautiful and feel like they have some connection to their culture because a lot of what I do, I try to take, um, like I said, I put meaning into it. So the material that I choose, um, some of it, like coming from my Navajo side, I'll put together the, um, abalone jet white shell and, um, turquoise because those are our protection stones, you know, as hope as Navajo people were supposed to wear those and have those on us as protection. And so, you know, 
to make that jewelry for someone to wear every day as protection. That's how I think about it is like I'm creating something like that for them as medicine, almost as protection medicine for them. And that's even in the clothes, like with the ribbon skirts. <sighs> to me, they symbolize strength in a way like you know if a woman is wearing a skirt and she's holding herself to that degree you shouldn't touch her in an in inappropriate way you shouldn't do things like that to her and so if women carry themselves in that way you know they're they're setting the standard down. for people they're saying you can't treat me this way because I don't think of myself that way yeah and so I want people to have that opportunity, which is also why I try to make it as accessible as I can to my community and to my people. And to me, my community is not just Hopi, but it's the larger native community. And so I understand that not all of us have disposable income. And so I try to make my um, work as um, reasonably priced as possible, knowing the amount of time and effort I put into it. You know, yeah, that, that you, you know that that turquoise protects Devin Booker as well. <laughs> oh yeah, it, tur turquoise is a protection color. You know, yeah, yeah, you know, it protects uh, him from the the Kardashians. So <laughs> hopefully, it'll protect the whole Suns fandom from the Kardashian curse. You know, Hirsch from the Yaf Boy wears two <laughs> arrowheads because he believes that Hopis are bad omens. Oh really? Yeah, he said it in the last podcast. Uh, probably because he thinks we're going to come back and <laughs> take the land back. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. I mean, like, you know, it, it's so great to hear well, well, your your side of things. Well, I, I, I know I kind of took up some time with that Phoenix Suns rant. So yeah, we're going to cut it out anyway. I'm going to cut it out anyway. a little bit longer than usual. But one of the <laughs> things that I wanted you to talk about, AJ, is that because the fact that, in you know, in this day and age, and you've done it for us largely, is that, you know, really that a lot of the marketing of what it is that you do, the work that you do, we now rely on social media yeah, to we do. do it. Yeah. And so, you know, like like at least as far as your strategies go what, what what are the best ways for the businesses out there that are up and coming starters or just want more visibility online what do you think is the best way to, to go about doing that or is it just bazaars and stuff like that <laughs> uh, for me i i did uh initially i didn't know like anything about how to market on social media i just posted my stuff and said, Hey, it costs this much <laughs> message me if you want it. <laughs> and so, you, you know, uh, that was how I started, you know, like, uh, Hopis are very bad at prices <laughs> yeah, for some reason. Like, are. you know, like we really, it's underprice like, okay, ourselves. okay. So I go to bazaars sometimes cause I, I do kind of support local artists cause you like rice Krispies. <laughs> and cause I want to see all the because pretty girls, like popcorn <laughs> balls, <laughs> but no, it's, it's so strange. It's like, you know, you go up to a place because and they have sells her tamales. <laughs> Do you have, they have all this nice jewelry, but there's no price tags to it. Nobody has price tags. And so you're wondering, and you're, you want to, every consumer person, consumer buyer wants to know the price first before they even look at the product. And if Hopis think about that, they should have like these huge displays of prices, like flashing lights, like fifty nine ninety nine. <laughs> you know, like for buy one, get one free kind of thing. And that I get, I think that if you were to do that at bazaars, yeah. you would sell out like quickly because people want to know prices first yeah. before they even see the product. I think that's true. Um, you know, everyone always asks that. And so I'll often tell them because it's a lot of work. Um, to do that, like physically, for me to get ready for a show, it takes at least four or five hours of preparation to get all the inventory ready and packaged and, you know, priced and all that stuff. And so it's just, a. I think for people, it's a it's an extra step that's hard to do. And so I think if you were to at least say, for me, what I've done to kind of combat that a little bit is everything, you know, in this section is $10. Everything in this section is 15. So I kind of yeah. group it at yeah, least yeah. and have something visible saying th this is the relative price of these items. But I think um, like you're saying, as long as people know so they don't have to like in a way be shot down by the price, yeah, yeah. it's easier than have than being turned up, turned away by that artist. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, I don't know. I think that. If we all as artists collectively learn how to price better and price accurately, 
and then understood, you know, this is the price that we all agree to pay one yeah, another, yeah. it would be better because then we wouldn't feel that um, – the discrepancy between people's pricing. We yeah, wouldn't you, think, oh, that's overpriced and that's underpriced. We'd you, all have a collective idea. Exactly. And and I, I say that because um, hearing the price is not the price that I want to pay because yeah. I want it to, for free you sometimes. Want, you want it to <laughs> fall I, I want it, your, I want it for free and, and my price range is free. You know, and see, I'm, and for that case, I'm like, well, <laughs> what do you have to trade me? I love bartering. And if you like, have, you want listen to my beautiful voice. Services. I said it's free. I'm entitled to this. <laughs> if you want, I'm native. Give me it. If you want broken cameras and uh, broken <laughs> Xboxes, Carl's your guy. But that's another thing too. Is I like I said, being accessible for people is I understand that especially as artists. Like for me, it's hard to say, oh, I want to buy something for myself. Yeah, because it's hard to like take that chunk of money that you worked hard for and treat yourself. And so whenever I want something for myself, I, I trade. I always so trade. who's, who's your biggest consumer right now for your art? I would say, um, urban natives, um, here primarily Phoenix and Albuquerque and then, um, up North, uh, like up in Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, North wow. Dakota. Wow. So I send off a lot of things out there and to California and to, to New York. So those are primarily my big places. And I know that because, again, I keep good record of where my stuff is sent out to. Um, I also read my analytics on the Instagram and stuff like that to see where my audience is from. Yeah, yeah. And so I understand where people are seeing my work. And so especially, like I said, because I know my audience is in Phoenix and Albuquerque, I try to set up there if I do in-person shows because at least then I know people know me there. Perfect. I mean, like it's... So strange to hear like a Hopi artist yeah. <laughs> selling <laughs> not Hopi work to Hopi people, but out on the, out on the uh, internet. On the, yeah. <laughs> out on the internet. But it, you have sold in like bazaars and stuff yeah. like that before just to get your name. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I like that because I feel like my community, um, they only know me as like the, as a kid because, uh, you know, I left here for about eight years, and yeah. so I was only a teenager. I was 18, 17, actually, when I left here um, to go to college. And that's all I ever did in high school was play volleyball and do academics. And so that's largely what people knew me for. And so coming back and now being this person who has a, a business and, you know, does these other things, that it, I'm getting more acquainted with people in my community again as an adult, you know, they're understanding who I am and what my goals are in my work. Because again, a lot of my work is to boost visibility of um, indigenous peoples in all all things, which is also why I work in the management and uh, marketing area. Because again, as Native people, it's hard for us to do it without being like commoditized. Yeah. Like especially doing it to ourselves. We don't want to sell ourselves. We want to sell what we have produced. And so that's a big thing, and I, I think I've done a pretty good job of that is um, having people know me by my work and not by my face. So a lot of the time, people don't know who it is running the Vehungnam Creations. They don't know it's me. But you know, then when they finally meet me, they're like, "Wow, I I've I seen it was your a dude. work." Yeah, yeah. And that's why I get that a lot. Actually, because I thought it was a dude. That's AJ, these they're like things. AJ. It's a guy, and they'll come up to my booth and they'll say, "Where's your boyfriend? Where's the artist?" I'm like, "It's me. <laughs> it's me. All of this, this jewelry, everything. Where's you your see handler? Me. <laughs> yeah. Is where's the male earlier on here? They're like, "Where's your where's your male? Where's your male?" <laughs> That's supposed to be accompanying you. Yeah. I, I only speak You're, to the man in yeah. charge. <laughs> and so, the man yeah, in charge. like that whole idea is funny. And then again, I've gotten that, especially from non-natives. Really? Yeah, because I've done, you know, like Santa Fe Indian Market and that's what Bahana's say to me. Where's your, uh, where's your husband? Yeah. Where's the artist? Where's AJ? I'm like, I'm AJ. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you ask me my name first? <laughs> but it's this weird... Cons I don't know, misconception that women don't run businesses. Yeah, yeah, They don't, yeah. and I think that's what it is, is I, you know, I did this uh, Native Women, Native Women Lead Business Retreat about three weeks ago, and that's, I think, what a lot of us have struggled with is we're not taken seriously only because we're women. 
Um, you know, people don't want to listen to us because they think we don't know what we're talking about or they don't want to buy from us because whatever reasons. But they have all these ideas behind women being business owners um, because I think they think we're only supposed to be homemakers. Exactly. That's why your reason why I only buy from men. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I guess that's kind of a reflection of the artists, the history of artistry on Hopi because yeah. then it's like yeah, all it the is. artists out our here men. are men. Our men, yeah. yeah. All the tehu makers, all the silversmiths, all the weavers are men. Our, all, and yeah, if you're every, a lady, then you're restricted to either basket work or yeah. pottery. Yeah. yeah. And that's how we see, that's how we're, we're so close yeah. minded to that. That's the reason why we just don't, know that women can do these. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I guess the, the, the main way to, cause you know, we did talk about like, how do you make yourself stand out? I guess really the work speaks, speaks for itself. Oh yeah. 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 That if you do quality, quality work, then people will ask for it because you know, when I, when I see how people market themselves on social media, like, I feel like that there's this narrative to where it's like, I'm native I'm from your community. You have to buy, buy from stuff. me. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, to me, I've always had this mentality like, no, fuck that. You gotta, you have to earn my business. Oh yeah, exactly. That whatever it is that you're making, it has to be good, good enough to, to the point to where I'm actually going to buy it because of the quality of work. And, you know, I, I think to, to Carl's point that, you know, the fact that I, I guess really that, that that's how you push yourself is that if you're an artist out there and uh, if business is good, then that, that must mean that you're a good artist. Exactly. And, you know, and if you're out there demanding that people buy your work because you're Hopi, then maybe that means you're not a good, you're, artist. you're a bad artist. Yeah. So it, it's, I, I look for things not jewelry wise. I don't look yeah. for textiles. I don't. For, I look for things that I can use like for everyday kind of Purposes, use. Yeah. yeah, like if it's a light switch thing, it looks nice. I'll buy it. I'll buy it because it makes my my little room look pretty cool and native and stuff like that. You know, I I, I really like those types of things like that. I don't I don't buy jewelry. I yeah. have a lot of. You jewelry. just have no need yeah. for it. And see, and that's an, another thing as an artist, you you have to understand that not everyone's going to want your stuff. Yeah, and. Don't be hurt by it because if you do, that's just going to hinder you as an artist. You're going to be focusing on that. You know, you're going to be questioning yourself and you're going to bring yourself down. Why doesn't this person want it? Well, they just don't. Just like you don't want whatever else. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And it's so great talking to you uh, as an artist. It's I I have one more question. I I, I meant to lead with this (laughs) and then I got distracted. And, you know, I apologize again for that. But on Rock Your Mox Day... Do you rock your moccasins? If you don't, why not? I do. Um, I have since it started. I don't know in two thousand what fifteen or What's whatever. What's rock your mox? <laughs> um, November what eleventh? I, I think I, so. I don't, I don't remember Columbus the day date. or something like that. Or yeah, it's like a week or two ago. But basically, it's just a day for you to wear your moccasins. Everyone's supposed to. You know, it's. Um, I don't even like wearing it's moccasins. It's like a visibility. What are you supposed, to? Are supposed to? <laughs> what the wrong with you? That's the uh, reason why I have uh, nice loafers on right now. <laughs> but I do. I, I wear mine. Um, I always wear my Hopi Totsis. Um, just, you know, because. But I don't wear, uh, again, kind of going back. I think we think you guys talked about this in the Hopi fashion episode from last year about, you know, wearing your moccasins with, uh, not like, pants. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I only wear my low-cut Hopi Totsis with pants. Anything else I will wear a skirt with. Um, anything like my my Navajo wraparounds and my white moccasins, I will wear a skirt. I um and I don't wear though I don't wear my white uh moccasins without my manta or without my um I don't have a ganelco somewhat. <laughs> so, you know, I I only wear my low cuts because to me they're more contemporary. They're like tennis shoes. You know, yeah, they're just they're just something to wear every day, and I will just sometimes wear them. But especially now because they're not durable in the winter, I will stop wearing them. But I just I wear them around the house and stuff like that just to wear them because that's <laughs> what my family does. All right, well, it's so great talking to you, and this is the third time I'm saying this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to end the show right now. <laughs> It, well, it's so great what, talking. What's wrong with talking with AJ? You don't like talking with AJ? AJ? I'm hungry. 
<laughs> she doesn't sell food. She sells, she sells rawhide. I can't. I, I'm going to eat. I'm going to boil that. Well, you know that. what? She gets in exchange for this stuff. Can buy food. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's so great talking to an actual artist that has their own business on social media and on, uh, you know, everywhere else. Yeah. And to hear the struggles behind it. So before we go, do you have any last words that you want to say for budding artists or artists that just in general that are actually struggling to get their name out? Yeah. Um, I want to offer my own, you know, help. So if you are out there listening and you have questions, you know, you want to know how to start or whatever, feel free to message me. I'll, you know, give you some pointers, give you some tips. Um, there's a lot of resources out there in terms of other um, people, other business owners. And it's good to talk with them, you know, people in your community, um, someone who's doing similar things to you, talk with them about, you know, their struggles, the things that they would do differently, because those are the people who've lived it and who understand it the most. Um, there is a lot of things that I think I would do different if I were to talk to myself six years ago. I would tell myself, um, do make, more capitalism be, be on more that. Make, make that Phoenix Suns merch. <laughs> yeah, they're good. You, you probably say, you know, like, I don't care about Hopi's. Let's capitalize on that shit. <laughs> but um, yeah, so like I said, I just want to offer that. Um, I think it has to come from you. You have to make an effort to kind of figure out what you need to do instead of just hoping someone's going to help you yeah. because that's like bystander effect feeling feeling like someone's going to do it for you you got to be proactive perfect 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 and, and then uh, i have to plug myself too. i was gonna ask <laughs> just about to ask you that where can people find you um so primarily i sell off my website which is www.thevehungnamcreations.com the vehungnam is t-u-v-e-h-o-n-g-n-o-m i can also be found on instagram as the Vehungnam underscore on Twitter, on Facebook, and on TikTok, I believe. But primarily, my website is updated very regularly, you know. So what's on there is readily available. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming in and being just a guest <laughs> instead of our intern. Do you have anything to ask her? As well, Nothing. I was going to ask you why. Why don't you rock your mocks? <laughs> rock um, my mocks? I never knew we had to rock my mo rock the mocks. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I don't rock my mocks either, and yeah. I, I don't know. I, I just like you. you just I, forget I think about the day. Regular shoes are much more comfortable. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, Hopi shoes are stupid. And I don't even wear you them. Don't wear them. I don't enough even to wear break them. them in. <laughs> <laughs> they're still all like crusty and <laughs> all, all slippery. Still, yeah, they're still all slippery. <laughs> I only wear them on uh, days you that only I only wear them when you have to, to. Well, only when I have to. And then I just switch to a uh, regular <laughs> when, when you have to wear them, you just take um, the, those swim shoes and you spray paint them that brownish color so that they look like yeah, I wear the, the, the Converse Throw shoes and just dirt uh, on it. Yeah. <laughs> Put some leather on top of your Converse shoes. <laughs> Well, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you again, AJ. <laughs> Thanks for, for having yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you guys have made it this far, thank you for listening to this one hour and 20 odd this minutes. This marathon long Yeah, episode. this mar marathon long episode here. So if you guys want to donate something, go to anchor.fm slash CJ podcast 85 to become a monthly donor. It's only $4.99 or $9.99 a month. Or if you guys just want want to donate a dollar or more go to buymeacoffee.com slash cj podcast to donate one dollar or more we are also going to be doing a live um facebook or whatever the instagram as well to for our final season and so it would be great for you guys to be there as well too you know what I find it a lot easier to do, Carl, is that uh, we don't mention some of these things that may not happen. It's so, going to happen. <laughs> and uh, if you're not following us on our social media accounts, you can find us at Carl and J-Man all across the boards on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. You can also, if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to give us a five-star review because your podcast 
is not five stars unless your Apple Podcast says you're five stars. And also, don't forget that we can be found on Amazon Music, which I think is pretty awesome yeah. because I just discovered Amazon Music. And you can find us on there as well. All right. Well, thank you for listening to Carl and AJ Save the World Podcast. My name is Carl, and this is my best friend, AJ. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> thank you for thank you for listening to Carl and J-Man Save the World podcast. My name is Carl and this is my best friend J-Man. <laughs> so long. Quick <laughs> quad. <laughs>